So hello and welcome to tonight's session, which is Growing Culturally Appropriate Food. Um, this session is being hosted by Capital Growth and it kicks off our series of three sessions or conversations called Growing Resilience Through Food. And we'll come back to the series um, and the thinking behind it in a moment. Um, but first, if you are joining us tonight from a laptop or a computer and you've got access to the chat function, this would be a really great time to just say hello, um, introduce yourself, um, perhaps the growing space that you're involved with or what's um, brought you to tonight's session. So that would be really nice for Idman and from, for Junior as well, just in terms of um, getting a sense of who's in the room and who's joining us tonight. So um, please uh, use the chat function. Um, and I'm just going to, yeah, I'll just let, let you know now, I'm going to uh, introduce myself for a moment and the Food Growing Network. I'll also do a little bit of Zoom housekeeping before I hand over to Idman and Junior so we can crack on with the amazing session that they've got planned for us this evening. Um, so just really quickly, my name is Fee McAllister. I coordinate Capital Growth. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, Capital Growth is a London food growing network comprising 3,000 growing spaces or members, part of um, food and farming charity Sustain. Um, we help Londoners who want to grow food. Um, we help them in a number of ways by providing lots of great training, running uh, volunteer and networking events, every year signposting for funding and jobs in the sector as well as creating spaces for grassroots activity like our upcoming good to grow weekend of action and we really want growers and growing projects to feel connected and part of something bigger by joining the network ultimately we really believe in the importance of urban food growing in creating more resilient communities. Um, which brings me to the last year and the pandemic. We've been supporting a number of community gardens through our community harvest initiative to grow with and for their local communities. I wonder how many times I can say the word community <laughs> in the next couple of minutes. Um, gardens um, have linked up with their mutual aid groups and food banks and other community groups and really stepped up um, and responded to the crisis by providing food, um, but also generally creating more resilience at a community level. And I'm sure so many of you tonight have been involved um, in these efforts. Um, and the themes that we're exploring through the Growing Resilience Through Food series have been really important and central to the gardens we've been talking to and supporting um, along their journeys throughout this last year. So we're really delighted um, to be hearing from uh, some inspiring uh, food growers and community leaders like Junior tonight, um, who will share their knowledge and provide ideas and um, practical takeaways. Um, I'd like to say a really big thank you to Idman Abdurrahman, who's developed and curated these sessions with us. Um, Idman's involved with uh, community-led food growing projects, including Cordwainers Grow in East London, um, and is, in, is also curating the upcoming Bloom series. If you haven't already checked it out, please do. It's um, a fantastic initiative platforming black nature practitioners across London. Um, so almost enough from me, just very quickly, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. I'm assuming that most of you uh, are familiar with Zoom by now. However, if you're not, please let me know via the chat or by signaling to me somehow, and I will do my best to help you uh, in the background. Um, tonight. But in the meantime, I do need to let you know that we're recording tonight's session. Um, it will be available to those people who've registered um, with the um, event. And um, please use the chat function. So use it just for general chat, for networking, but also to ask any questions or things that you want to hear more um, from Junior about. And Idman will be helping Junior um, to field those questions. And uh, just to let you know, I hope you don't mind, but I will also be dropping some links and other information in the chat periodically. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Idman and then Junior. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Fiona um, and Capital Growth for hosting this um, program. Um, my name is Idman Abdurrahman. Um, I am an environmentalist and also part of Four Greatest Grow small uh, community organization based in East London. Um, I'm really excited to have uh, put together the series for Capital Growth. 
and then throughout the pandemic, pandemic, I think we've started to acknowledge the important role community gardens and urban food growing spaces um, play when it comes to improving our health, well-being, and the environment, but also when it comes to addressing wider societal challenges, um, such as access to green space and food insecurity. Um, and the aim of this series really um, is to provide a space where we can together reflect on what it means to creating um, welcoming environments and resilient communities through the practice of food growing and community gardening. Um, and throughout the sessions, we will hear from some incredible, um, as you said, Fiona, inspiring individuals and gardens who positively impact their communities. Um, this evening, we will start off by having a conversation centered around growing culturally appropriate foods. So we're super excited to welcome Junior Mutonga. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction, um, Junior is a community food grower, social entrepreneur, and the founder of the organization One Love Community and One Love Ubuntu, and creator of Meanwhile Space Garden in London. He's also the um, currently the project manager um, for the Belly Initiative and has been a member of Black Roots since its inception. And Black Roots is a Black-led uh, food growing collective um, at Wolves Lane. Um, before we dive into things, I just want to say that there will be plenty of time for further discussion amongst us all and for you to ask Junior some questions as well. Um, you're more than welcome to put your questions, any thoughts, reflections um, in the chat box and we will read them out towards the end of the session. Um, without further ado, I'll happily pass it over to you, Junior. Um, to start off, I would love to hear a little bit about how you started getting into um, community growing and your journey and relationship to urban food growing. Cool. Right, thank you, Edmund. And um, thank you, Fiona Capital Growth. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I did notice, first and foremost, that there were a couple of people in the chat that just put their mention up and I can't see them here. But hello, Glenda, wherever you are. I'm hoping to hear from you a little bit later on in the call. And um, and also Ruth as well, down in Stratton, doing awesome work in the community garden down there that I recognise. Probably loads of other awesome people doing amazing things, probably many times better food growers than I am. Um, I'm just somebody that has a real passion for food growing. Um, I'm currently actually working um, as an apprentice food grower, working to grow culturally appropriate crops um, in Wolves Lane with an organization called Black Roots, as was mentioned before. But Edmund, if you could just remind me, what was your question that you wanted me to speak on there? Sorry. So I just wanted to kind of um, hear a little bit about um, what kind of what's the introduction? What was the introduction to um, community food growing? And yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, it's been a bit of a, it's been a strange journey for me um, getting into food growing. and actually started with the, the, the role, the professional role I was doing before food growing was actually, well, before gardening was actually working as a corporate banker. So quite different. I'm not a corporate banker, working within corporate finance. So um, I had a career in there and then I stepped away from that um, to pursue other things, um, which has led to the social, um, social entrepreneurial work that I do now. But um, basically, as a story, how it, how, it, how, it, how it developed is actually really quite interesting. I'm a great believer in how the universe works. Like, so, you know, things tend to come together in beautiful ways. Um, I wouldn't say all by themselves with a lot of intention, a lot of hard work as well, a lot of risk taking. So my main risk was actually stepping out of the corporate world to think about what I could do to apply my time and my energy to actually make a difference to this world, do something positive. Um, so stepping away from that, um, I did turn into a bit of a hippie for a little while. Um, which was great fun. Um, we set up really good projects. Um, I was doing a project. The first project I ever did was in Hackney. Um, it was a, at a venue called Passing Clouds. Um, it was a great opportunity to really connect with a lot of awesome people, um, a lot of awesome ideas. This was back in 2012. Um, but prior to that, I had started to work as a um, commercial um, gardener. So I was actually doing the gardens at Quaker House and doing various private garden jobs in North London whilst I was having my hippie lifestyle. So basically, um, the first organization I set up was a, a group of a lady called Charlene called One Love Get Real. Back in 2012, we wanted to have a chat to everybody who seemed to have so many awesome ideas about how to make the world better, about what we could really do. Like we, how could we take One Love into getting real and actually do some stuff. But after that turned into like a bit of a talking shop, I started to investigate. Um, I was living in Tower Hamlets at the time, so I just fell in love with all the community garden projects that were going on, the massive Bengali community, all the food that was grown there. I was actually living in a homeless hostel at the time as well, 
So within that time, I was able to volunteer a lot of my time. Um, basically, um, to get towards where we are now, I set up, I helped to set up various um, food ground spaces in hostels, hospitals, estates, places where you wouldn't necessarily ordinarily imagine that food would grow. Um, and working with communities like that, working with the Bengali community in, in Spitalfields and Bangla Town and around areas of Tower Hamlets um, and how I met Glenda through the awesome work that Wen does. So I was really, really active with community gardens as a lot of you are and maybe some of you are just starting, but it led me to really thinking again about how I could use my skill set to help people in a more effective way. So in 2015, um, we managed to set up a project called Nomadic Community Gardens, which was um, set up on a de previously derelict space. It's right next to Brick Lane, um, Shoreditch, Hipsters and all of that stuff, but also right in the heart of Bangla Town. So really the idea was to mix that whole, um, to create um, food growing spaces, not just for the Bengali community who were crying out for spaces to grow food, but also like, you know, the people that like organic food and different also homeless projects and young people and linking everybody into community spaces is really what my passion is. Um, is in and around. So doing that taught me a lot, always learning a lot. Community gardens to me are the best, um, the best ways to grow food um, and definitely to connect to it as an entry point. So unfortunately, um, unfortunately, I ended up leaving community gardening in 2015 for about four years. But what I was doing is over another side of the Tower Hamlets, we were setting up projects. So basically instead of outdoors, we moved indoors. So we were setting up a lot of projects for the community, um, loads of projects in the E14 Canary Wolf area, which is like the Isle of Dogs, where you've got Canary Wolf and the Isle of Dogs, poor people, rich people. So we like to play games with areas like that and create a project basically to support a lot of people there. Um, just as a runoff to explain um, what that was in context, we set up a recycled furniture project, um, music studio, two, two gyms, um, co-working um, office spaces, co-working art spaces, um, various shop outlets that we made available to community as pop-ups as businesses that they were able to incubate, um, event spaces, dance studio, fashion studio, all sorts of different things. So we created hubs in spaces which were previously derelict. So the nomadic model works on, on land spaces, but it developed so that we're actually using that, using buildings and spaces to help the community in that way. So just linking it back um, over the past couple of years, um, I've been working more closely with an organization called Ubele, the Ubele Initiative, who actually based at Walls Lane Horticultural Centre in um, Tottenham. Um, so working closely with them, they're a Black-led um, group that support um, organisations all across the country, um, diaspora-led organisations across the country, um, to help create some more sustainability for social enterprises at grassroots levels. So I'm working with them and they are incubating currently, we've been incubating for the past two years, a project called Black Roots. So Black Roots is specifically a project which is aimed to support um, culturally appropriate foods being grown in the UK um, as a main part. But um, we discovered this sort of need when, um, we'll say a need, but there are a lot of people growing in allotment spaces, a lot of people that are growing independently by themselves and growing some amazing crops without much support, um, much structure behind what they're doing. So being able to network and connect people to share views and to share information and to share practices has been one thing, but what we're thinking about with Black Roots is really how to take that to an enterprise level so we can actually start to generate finances and, and reinvest the finances back into the community and, and set up commercial models, as well as the community models that we apply in order to create more sustainability that doesn't rely on grant funding to enable the activities that we do, which involve a range of different things, which we're gonna to touch on a little bit later when I speak more specifically about Black Roots itself. But um, that's been my journey, I hope that, make some sort of sense it was a bit here and there and everywhere but basically um community gardens as much as much as as much as i was able to benefit from being part of as a volunteer community gardens now um and moving on since 2015 really trying to create spaces and to support people to support more people to be able to have those benefits and again as i said to be able to take it more into um a more commercial um level as well so i hope that answers your question Edmund or that was perfect, thank you. And then, sorry. No, I said that was perfect, thank you. Sorry, would you, would you like me to go into my presentation? Would you like me to go in and speak a little bit more about the things that I've got to speak about today? Or is there any questions at this point from anybody? 
I don't think there's any specific questions in the group chat. Mm, yeah, if you want, you can just dive into your presentation. Yeah. All right, well, um, I've been asked to come and speak about a couple of things in terms of the work that we're doing um, up in Tottenham at Wolves Lane. I'm really, really, really keen to hear about um, some of the other work or, or types of work that you guys would like to do that involve cultural food growing. Um, Glenda, I'm going to pick on you again. I don't know where you are, but um, <laughs> linking back again to the, to the work we're doing at Black Roots, um, I actually met Glenda through a group called the Master Organic Gardeners back in um, 2014 while we were setting up Nomadic Gardens. And um, I'm, I'm saying that to say this is that Glenda was one of my, truly one of the inspirations. I met Glenda and a guy called Robbie, truly one of my inspirations about what could be done with vegetables. At the time, I was um, totally obsessed with organic food. I, I'm a vegetarian, so the nutritional value for myself and connecting to food that I've grown myself is very important in that regard. But Glenda and Robbie particularly, I remember they opened up my imagination back in 2014 about the types of um, um, indigenous crops that you could actually grow here in the UK. Um, so previously, um, previously to that, I, I, had, I had known of um, and worked quite closely with a project called the Eden Project. So obviously, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know about the, the domes and the um, awesome setup that they have over there, which isn't necessarily accessible to everybody to use, but the ability to grow crops in that way, I found really fascinating as well. Um, but I didn't actually think it was possible to, to, to really do it ourselves. Um, and also, um, I love like history, do you know what I mean? And like, um, I used to start to look at, um, one time it's because of a visit to a place called the Bedford Wall Gardens. Um, I hope it's still there. It was an awesome project being developed um, down in Essex. But basically I was introduced to the idea that, um, that the Kings that used to um, go over to colonial countries back in the day that tasted the amazing fruits and stuff like that, couldn't actually transport it over. Obviously the transport isn't what it is as it is today. Um, so what they actually did, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong with this, but as far as this is this as far as as far as the stories that were told to me around this at the time, there were walled gardens created with glass and heating that were able to create tropical environments similar to what's done at the Eden Project. So certain people could actually have access to these type of crops um, and type of um, type of food growing and these types of foods. But um, I'm really interested, and one of the interest reasons I'm really interested in community food growing is providing that access to as many people as possible. Um, and so again, going back to that, that, that the idea that was planted in my head by people like Glenda and Robbie about the idea of, of growing things like sweet potatoes and dasheen and callaloo and things like that in this country absolutely fascinated me. Um, so again, I'll say thank you to Glenda, but when it comes to actual knowledge about food growing, um, people like Glenda have so much more awareness and knowledge than, than me. And, and for information to share some of the people I work with, like the person who was supposed to be here today, Sister, um, Sister Paulette, um, unfortunately couldn't be here this evening. Um, she's one of my mentors um, when it comes to food grain and other things, but the amount of food grain knowledge that these people have is incredible and working alongside them is so beneficial for me. It's so exciting for me to find opportunities to invite more and more people from the community just to connect to some of these amazing people and the knowledge, the knowledge that they have. So um, in terms of actually te technical knowledge, I mean, if there's things, specific things that you'd like to know, I'm not picking on you, Glenda, but if there are questions like that, we can follow it up with, with real experts, which is, again, one of the reasons for forming Black Roots is really grabbing on, onto that, that knowledge base and really, really sharing that expertise with as many people as we can. So I'll, I'll move on to um, what it is that I've been asked to speak about today. So if you don't mind, I'll share a screen, go through a couple of slides. I won't keep it too slidey. I'm going to probably be about 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open up the floor to any questions um, that you guys have. And um, Edmund or Fiona, if there's anything that anybody does pop up in the chat that's relevant to what I'm saying, please feel free to um, stop me. And But in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll just give you a quick run through about, um, so um, I'm not very technical as well, so bear with me. All right, can everybody see that screen? Yeah? Cool. All right, then, well, um, da, 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 da. okay. Um, so basically, I've been asked to speak about the, um, the growing culture of public foods um, in the UK. So the themes we're going to touch on, basically, we've spoken a little bit already about black roots, but I'll just speak a little bit more about how that works and, and my involvement in that and, and potentially your involvement in that. 
um, and just touch on um, a couple of like different kind of reasons, not even not like the traditional reasons why growing culturally appropriate foods is important. And also just ways that we may be able to adapt um, practices of growing more appropriate, um, appropriate <laughs> culturally appropriate crops in the UK. So um, let's move on to black roots. Um, so black roots, black roots is set up back in 2019. It was a Ubele um, supported initiative um, which is really looking at a collective, as I said, of like a collective of different types of levels of different black food growers um, who are growing and, and tend to grow indigenous crops, but also black led organizations that might need support in different ways to other organizations. So um, um, I was reading out the mission statement that was put together. So you hear it from their words and not from our words and not just mine. Um, the mission so Black Roots is a network of black growers that aims to create sustainability, sustainable business models which facilitate horticulture and cultural knowledge through the creation of, the, of a decolonized safe space where black people can come to encourage a wider community to appreciate the potential of growing to sustain a positive life through embracing cultures of African diaspora. So that being our mission statement, just to touch a little bit about more, what we, more of what we do, you can see from the side, Sister Paulette, who you can see there on the left-hand side, um, who would have been here today, amazing, amazing, amazing elder, who um, if, if at any point you guys get to experience, in fact, actually through the work of Black Roots, some of the stuff that we will be doing in the future and um, coming up over the next even, I don't want to say for certain, look out over the next sort of six months, but definitely going over the next couple of years, we're going to be doing a lot of workshops led by Sister Paulette and others um, exactly um, about the technicalities of actually how to grow through um, culturally appropriate crops, specifically yourself, and also opportunities to join this community, um, to join the community food growing schemes that we have, and also the availability of some of these produce um, will be extended over the next six to 12 months as we're developing Black Roots as an organization. So if I speak on that a little bit more first, and then maybe it might give that a bit more context. So sorry. So for Black Roots, um, so what we've, what we've got at the moment is we've, we've been working, as I said, over the past two years, really developing um, a dialogue and understanding, going out into the community to um, connect with um, as many of the food growers that we can, we can connect to in the community, mainly in and around Tottenham at the moment. Um, and so essentially how we see it is, um, how we see it from a Ubele point of view is we work intergenerationally, intergenerationally with a lot of the things that we do. So there's a lot of information that might come from, um, so let me just stop sharing that screen. Can I do that? Did I stop the screen? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, sorry. Um, basically, what it is, um, sorry, let me just go into this, yep. Yeah. So as the Bellows an organization, what we do is we look to work intergenerationally. So we work from very young age to, 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 to a very, to every age possible. So basically we have a lot of elders in our community that are growing food in allotments, unsupported, independently, and they're not passing on their skills. There's no one to pass them on to, but I mean, within allotments, as many of you know, the community there itself do share a lot of the skills um, that they have, resources that they have, et cetera. Um, which happens quite actively. But one of the concerns was, I mean, um, to put it bluntly, I mean, they're not going to be around with us forever. So, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the, um, the, the, the information that they do have is massively, massively important to us um, to hold on to, to, to learn from them directly. And also really important for them as well to understand that they're really part of a community. They really have vital information that they might see as being totally normal that actually is super valuable to us. I work with a lot of young people. So sometimes just to be able to take a young man for an afternoon away from wherever he, he was gonna be that afternoon and take him into an allotment, take him into a community garden, bringing them around some of these elders, you know, some of these young men aren't even that close to their parents, let alone grandparents, you know? So they don't actually get to even connect to people from an elder generation, you know? And this is just to highlight one of the importance of why intergenerational work is so important for what we do. So um, if we're working with the elders, we always have to find a way to bring that right back down to the youngest generation that can connect with them at every time. So um, I say that to say this is that then that allows us the opportunity to find different programs um, and, and projects that we can do that support the, the work that's already happening then it can also support the different works from different youth organizations, different school groups that's already happening in terms of the education. Now, in terms of some of the technical knowledge, we actually probably learn from them 
more than we teach them when we're speaking about the elders at the allotment. But then when we're speaking with some of the elders and the knowledge that they have, this can revolve around things like herbal medicines, how different varieties and methods of how to cook your food, how to even store your food, let alone cultivating your food. So all of those different variety of lessons that you can learn, what we did look to do with Black Roots is think about how we can put those different components together to maximize the opportunities for others. So if there's, for example, um, um, if, 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 for example, we have a group of young, we, we work with young, with young people through um, Sister Sandra, um, young people through schools. So through the school programs, people can come into our spaces and not only learn how to grow the appropriate, appropriate, culturally appropriate crops as amongst others from seed, but also take it to plate. So also within the different variations of the recipes is really great, um, particularly in an area like Tottenham, because as much as the young children might not have a particular interest in the food, the growing the food itself, as in actually harvesting and being there, a lot of them do really want to get their hands dirty. A lot of them just want to eat food. A lot of them just want to eat tasty, delicious food. And it gives us an opportunity to just absolutely do that. So you're being introduced to foods that you're eating at home, and then it creates that imagination about, well, how is this grown? Well, look, grandpa over there has been growing it for ages. We couldn't do anything without him, you know? And it's different ways for me that the, the fascination comes into it and how many ways it can connect different aspects of the community in different ways. So, I mean, looking at the group here now, there's not many people that are people that would necessarily be black from what I can see. There may be some off camera, but then at the same time, it still leads into the fact that the type of knowledge that's been shared and developed here how what ways can we get that out into other groups what ways can we set up you know um grandma's recipe books and different functions like different webinar where we can we, we can literally we can get some of the young people that are just totally obsessed with social media to come out have a fun afternoon in a community project or an allotment with some other people and then put that content out so there's really different ways that we can start to get that information made to wider um, a wider audience, which again is one of the real reasons why I'm really excited about working, um, sorry, being invited by Capital Growth and some of the work that Capital Growth's doing, and hopefully linking into ways that we'd be able to measure some of the appropriate, culturally appropriate um, crop quantities alongside some of the um, amazing work that Capital Growth has done already with the wider community gardens. So um, I will talk forever, but I mean, at the same time, just to bring it back to point, um, what I will do is I'll just cut back over to these slides again and just to um to, just to go back to just to go back to some of the reasons, some of the reasons for growing um corporate culturally appropriate foods, some of the stuff that like I suppose um might surprise some, might not um to others. But to me, what I found really totally fascinating when it came to specifically um developing my understanding around the, the people involved in culturally appropriate, uh, uh, um, in culturally appropriate foods, not just the, the, the ones that we're able to grow here, but a lot of people that, that actually cook and source those indigenous meals and, and share that with people from their communities. Is it, it's absolutely amazing way to connect um, cultures and ancestors, connecting to cultures and ancestors in a way that um, it might not be widely recognized as an important factor to people, but essentially what this does is it gives, um, people a real connection to their history of people that they may not have ever seen. A lot of people are second, first, third generation and removed from the countries that they're from. So just in terms of the food that's grown, just in terms of the, some of the, the food that's eaten, like some of my Nigerian and Ghanaian brothers, some of the food that they eat, for example, it really adds to their sense of cultural um, strength. And that's a really important thing for, I would say a young man, but for young people and people to have um, as they grow and develop. So that's something that we really want to really look at when we're working with some of the young people, particularly is remembering that ancestral lineage to the food as well. Um, as I touched on before, passing on knowledge, but also stories as well. Like, and, and when I say knowledge and stories, the reason I say that um, in this context more so is that for community food growing, particularly to anything else, and really, as I said before, really connecting the intergenerational, connecting experts with people that are interested in the different ways that that can connect is that essentially not only the techniques that are used, um, the techniques that are used, the, the, the crops that are grown, the, 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 the methods that can be used for it, how the weeds can be, be used, you know? Um, um, these sorts of things, how they're shared when people are working together, when people are cultivating the land together, and also when people are eating together. It's a something, again, it's quite like, um, call it, um, what's the right word that I'm looking for? It's quite, tribalist, it's ancestral, it's something that goes back into the root of who we are. 
and um, stories and knowledge and, and sharing um, is something that is experienced, I think, in a beautiful way in community food growing, um, farming, harvesting at every stage, sowing the seeds and, and, and sharing the food itself when you're eating or sharing that food with others. There's so many different aspects of that, that there's an enrichment that, um, that not only a lot of you know already, but my main thing is how can more people experience and benefit from that? Um, nutritionally, I think it's, it's pretty well documented that the amount of superfoods and different varieties of types of food that are providing like much higher content. Um, for example, a couple that we grow, um, callaloo, quinoa, things like this that are spoken, okra, things that are spoken about for the high nutritional value are things that we can grow here very well, but also linking into the understanding, again, going back to the, the, the previous two for the culture, the ancestors, the knowledge and the stories, is that really thinking about how, um, how, sorry, how some of the, 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 the actual traditional um, plants that are used that we aren't able to grow can also be used as supplement diets. I mean, that can be something that can also be brought into the conversation and around um, the crops that we grow. So for example, baobab and moringa and things that people might then um, start to notice are growing back in their, in their original countries, but maybe they might think that might not, might, they may not be able to grow here. But also I've got two young children that live in Australia so um, being out in Australia um, in previous years, um, I, I come across some very, very, very interesting projects, um, receiving what they call the baobab, baobab tree, which is the baobab tree in Africa, and how that connects with a lot of different, um, bringing back some of the cultural understanding in somewhere like Australia. And I think about that a lot because my kids are there, but it's, it's the same, my children are there, but it's the same principle in terms of growing indigenous foods in different countries and the type of effect that that can have. Um, so again, um, nutritionally, um, the wider benefits, not just to the food and any food, any food to me that you've grown, that you've sourced and you've grown locally and you can pick and eat it within the shortest space of time as possible, automatically has more vital and nutritional content to me on lots of different levels. So that and aside, um, also a fascinating aspect to me is more the medicines. Um, and some of the reasons I say that is because, um, again, I mean, I, like I always emphasize community, community gardens um, and community food growing and the community and, and what you learn from them. And it's just different times when you could be with people and it's whether you're foraging, whether you're looking at plantain, I learned about a while ago that is just basically everywhere that you can use for so many different things. A lot of people obviously know about nettles and stuff like this, but then it's also um, people, like I, I learned a lot from um, people from Eastern European countries about certain foods that they were harvesting from the street. And there's, there's two plants. There's, um, I, I learned that one was a type of mulberry, mulberry plant um, from some ladies from Romania. And then I noticed them around the corner as well and they were picking this other plant. I can't use that because the process that they have to use in order to get what they needed to get out of it for medicine was about a three or four month process. And it was, but it, again, it's just leading back to the idea that if we can start to grow some of these foods and grow things that people have cultivated in their past and, and have those wider benefits, it's not just a connection for them, but actually it's a connection for other people in terms of health. Another example is that um, the Jochen, that um, sister, sister, sister Paulette grows in, um, up in Tottenham. It's, it can be used as an alternative to a, a sugar plant. So um, it's turning to sugar. So some of the elders are using it for teas and cakes and biscuits and things like that so they can still get their sweeteners but actually it's nutritional rather than dangerous in the way that sugar is and a lot of these types of food without having that medical knowledge but they, there's a lot of diabetes and a lot of health concerns that people from indigenous countries may experience here that actually in connecting to a lot of the food through the imagination or the the, the just by connecting to foods that they may not have done before have actually connected to medicines that have helped them greatly and I wouldn't want to pick up on too many of the stories in case I'll get it in details a bit wrong but absolutely fascinating stories about how people have connected back to their foods and actually found ways to to heal themselves with, with different food products but putting that aside um just to touch on a couple more points from for today um just to let you know a bit about black roots and what we're able to do in terms of the foods that we grow. And so here are a list of foods that we're currently growing at black roots at the moment. So we've got callaloo, um, which is a type of vegetable. Um, a lot of you know, it's called amaranth as well. In a lot of places, very highly nutritious um, vegetable. 
which we grow quite easily and we've grown it in quite quite abundantly. It's really easy to grow. And then chow chow, the sweet potatoes, and the moringa, and the okra and kodu, a little bit more difficult. Um, chow chow is a fruit that's grown in the Caribbean, mainly some places in South America. Sweet potato, we all know, but may generally think that we can't actually grow it here. So there are techniques that are developed in a lot of allotments anyway, but Black Roots have developed a lot of techniques to grow sweet potatoes very effectively as well. Um, moringa, um, we're able to grow moringa leaves at the moment, not actually just the, 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 the full trees, but we're able to grow the leaves for plants, so that, that's something that's available. Um, also, okra is grown, and kodu, which is grown um, amongst Black Roots, but it's a vegetable that was introduced to me, a lot of you might know, from the, mainly from the Bengali community. It's a large gourd that you may see hanging around outside, even outside people's homes, like particularly around the East London or areas of the high Bengali community. Um, something that totally fascinated me. I learned a lot from um, a lady called Lutvan in Spitalfields um, Farm down in East London about that. And again, some of the work that Lutvan does with the Bengali community absolutely blows my mind in terms of just what it means for people to be connecting to plants that they, that they, that they grew when they were children. Um, but and also the ways that they grow it absolutely amazing um but um and just moving on again some of the other plants that we grow there's many different varieties of greens and particularly the new zealand spinach is something that people have found quite interested and recognized quite a lot the different types of kale that we grow there's grapes melons and varieties of squashes and beans that are grown excitingly we've got a few new crops that we're um experimenting with cultivating a few already on their way like we've got soursap coming again that will just be the leaves rather than the fruit um, we've got edo, which is a type of yam, um, traditionally grown in Africa, also the Caribbean, but um, it's something that we're going to be able to hopefully grow quite successfully and have some available, I believe, later on this year. Um, Ochocho and ginger and turmeric are in, in the lands to be grown. Um, they're crops that are indigenous. Well, ginger and turmeric are crops that we, we use a lot. Um, Ochocho is used a lot in the Caribbean and I believe South America as well. But with the ginger and the turmeric, it's something that we, again, we want to really um, um, cultivate, not just to a level of actually being experimental about what we're growing, but really looking to take that, not necessarily to a highly commercial level, but to, to really grow a high yield of, of the ginger and the turmeric and to share practices that can be done as well as the, the fruit and um, the food that is produced, that we're able to produce. And I don't know what we're like for time at the moment, but... Um, I could round up there and then maybe leave it open to questions. I know there'll be a lot more people that actually have projects and initiatives that they're aware of that they may be able to share, or maybe some questions that Edmund or Fiona, you might have to pose. But just here, there's a few links that I know that there were links shared in the chat before, but um, just about the organization, like Wolves Lane um, is a horticultural center based in, top, based in Tottenham, up in um, Wood Green. Um, the website details are there, will be more open um, coming on from the 12th of April. Um, that host markets, different workshops, volunteering opportunities, training opportunities, all sorts of different ways to get into whole culture. It's an amazing, amazing space. And I will say another thing in relation to Wolves Lane as well, actually, um, something that I found when it comes to, we're talking about indigenous um, culturally appropriate crops. In Wolves Lane, what you'll find is you'll find the cactus section um, run by an amazing gentleman called NK, who's actually, um, as I, every single time I'm with NK, I learn more about the desert, life, the stars, everything, just through these cactuses. It's the most amazing experience. So if everyone, anyone does have the opportunity to get down there, definitely, definitely check that out. And I won't say too much, but I would say this is that um, he's convinced me that I'll be able to survive in the desert on cactuses alone. And he's actually shown me how and what I need to do. So I'm not gonna try it, but it's absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, and again, Bulls Lane is where Ubele is based and Black Roots is based. Um, so some of the work that we're doing, some of the workshops and sessions we're going to be doing um, over the next, again, six to 12 months as we're reintroducing the project after the, not being able to do. So while I say, the, sorry, Black Roots has actually had to stop a lot of the operations, obviously, as a lot of other people have during, during the COVID lockdown. But I didn't actually mention a lot of the amazing work that um, particularly Sister P and Sandra have been doing from Black Roots is as we weren't able to develop the crops and develop the projects in the way that we had planned, what we were then able to do is to sort of rejig the project so we are able to provide um, a really large quantity of foods that were able to supplement food banks, um, which included culturally appropriate crops. 
and also supply people directly in the community that might have had financial needs when it comes to um, acquiring foods, etc. So there was a lot of work that Black Roots, not just Black Roots, a lot of the guys at Wolves Lane were doing in support of COVID over the last year, which is actually unfortunately stopped a lot of the operations that we've done, but in a lot of ways, um, it was something that was very interesting to react to. But now we're coming into 2021, we're really looking to re-establish the operation there. So keep an eye out um, through the Wolves Lane newsletter, the Ubele newsletter, um, if you can sign up to that about any of the developments that, that will be happening there. And definitely, definitely, if you get an opportunity to come down and visit. And also um, one of my other mentors, amazing cultural food grower, um, um, Sandra, who runs an organisation, Go Grow With Love, who, we're growing, who I'm learning from and growing a lot of the culture of appropriate crops in um, Tottenham with as well as awesome work with the young people is um, available to follow on Instagram at Go Grow With Love. So that's, I think, everything for me. So if I stop sharing the screen now, I think you've got the links somewhere anyway. So I think that'll be all for me now. Thank you everybody for your time. And um, as I said, if you've got any questions or anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Junior. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your experience and the amazing work that you do over at um, Black Roots and Ubele, um, really captured the essence of, of what, you know, we wanted tonight's session to be, just to kind of initiate the conversation about the importance of, of growing culturally appropriate food. And yeah, if you guys are interested in um, specific um, practical training sessions, make sure to keep an eye out on Ubele Social and hopefully Capital Growth will also continue on this thread and provide, um, practical training sessions as well. And yeah, I mean, um, I know Paulette, who, who was going to do this session tonight, um, is probably going to come in at some point with Capital Growth and, and lead a session. But yeah, it's so many beautiful comments on the, um, on the group chat. I have some questions, if you don't mind me. I'm just going to pick out some, because there's quite a lot to go through here. Um, we have. Dave Richards asked, um, has Black Roots produced a manual or a planting list? Do you know uh, hmm. that? Who, who is that? So who is that that asked that? Dave, Dave Richards. Yeah, all right, Dave. That's a great question, Dave. And actually, I know that a guy called William Welsh is going to be very happy <laughs> that that <laughs> question has been asked. It's something that um, William and the guys, um, William and Arlene are working on as, as we speak. Um, mm. So that will be available. and. Um, yeah, as soon as that is, as I said, um, just as everything is in development, it's just about when that's launched. So if you keep an eye out on it, um, if there's any way that we can directly share information, perhaps through capital growth when that happens, we will do. So maybe just keep an eye out and, and as and when that happens, but it will be all in line with the work that William and Arlena are doing to develop um, Black Roots over the next six months. So we should be have something ready within a year, I'd say. Great. Um, we had another question from Charlie. Um, and Charlie asked, do you think it's possible to grow enough here to reduce the reliance on supermarket produce um, brought in from abroad? Don't know if you can answer that. I don't know if I can answer that better than a lot of other people here <laughs> no. can answer that, but if anybody, um, anybody that knows me will know that my true answer to that is actually yes. Like, <laughs> but um, it might not sound as practical as it might be, but I'm a dreamer, you know, and that my thing is just the more the merrier, you know, like I don't, I, 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 I can't imagine food growing everywhere is, is yeah. but it's just depends on, on how things shift around. And there's been a massive growth in it already, do you know what I mean? And um, I think that looking at what I know that a lot of people are doing now, there's gonna be an, an increase in the amount of food that people are already buying that will be grown here and locally or as local as possible to London mm -hmm. over the next few years. I can say that based on the work that people are doing comfortably, but not for everybody, you know, but some people like to eat meat at McDonald's, so they'll be all right, so. <laughs> um, we have, there's so much coming in. Um, also, people are just thanking you for an amazing- oh, Thank you, and thank you everyone for your kind words as well. Um, I think we have there's another question here from um wendy she said um which which do you think what do you think are the best type wait which do you think are the best what are the what plants would you suggest to grow sorry i can't read this um which do you think is the best reason so what plants do you think are the best to grow outdoors um, she said that she was going to try amaranth, but what else do you suggest? Sorry, the wording of that. Um, a bit. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, it's largely dependent. Amaranth Callaloo, that's a great one to grow. It's, it's, it's quite easy to do. It's robust. We grow a lot of it in abundance um, where we are down in different sites in Tottenham where we grow. I am not an absolute food expert. Like, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, 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 I'm learning from really people that are, that are expert in it. But what I do know is that it's a lot of it's down to temperature. So a lot of it's not necessarily for these culturally appropriate crops. A lot of it is based on the spaces that we can develop. So we've got a lot of greenhouse space um, up in Moors Lane. We've got polytunnel spaces in and around areas so we're able to keep the heat up. And also the techniques, a lot of the techniques that are done are cultivated techniques. For example, um, keeping different methods to keep the soil temperature up whilst you're growing things that are growing under the ground, for example, for yams and the sweet potatoes and things like that are beneficial. But also different systems that are used in terms of like, um, I know that my sister, for example, amazing food grower, uses a lot of the techniques that she used that she learned back home in Zambia. Mm. But she uses like a tubular system for her, for, for her potatoes that she swears by, but other people don't necessarily use these sorts of things. So it's definitely different techniques that suit your area, which again, is part of the reason we're speaking to people, experimenting and trying out what it is that you do. Amaranth Kalalu, I think that's a great one to start with, but um, I wouldn't necessarily want to say um, for the types of crops that we're growing specifically that they're things that you can experiment with, but definitely if you have like access to greenhouses, glass houses and stuff like that, which is something, again, we want to try to see if we can make that something that we can make more available in some ways. But um, other than that, other than having the right conditions, it's quite difficult. But maybe somebody might, somebody else might have an idea of, of a simple plant that can be grown. Yeah, please, if you guys um, share any any um, tips that you guys have as well, I see that a lot of people are trying or growing a range of different foods. Um, we have um, a question from Haley, and she asked, um, "What can what can white people do uh, to actively support black communities and other marginalized communities in communal growing spaces?" That's a very interesting question. Yes. Um, that my first answer to that would be is that. I mean, I'm an advocate for community. So my thing is always, how can we support each other? Do you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't never go to like, an estate full of young people and, and talk about the support we can give to them. It's more about how can we work together to find ways to work together better, do you know what I mean? So um, conversations, that's where a lot of things start, you know, like sharing ideas. If you've got resources, they've got resources, sharing resources is always beneficial. But I think that for me, it's, it's a difficult question because I understand the challenges in what you're speaking about being somebody that's evidently black, growing in a lot of food spaces and on a lot of times being the only black male person there is quite um, difficult and challenging and has brought a lot of different challenges in a lot of different ways. Um, how would I answer that? Truly how I'd answer that, truly, truly how I'd answer that and having some really difficult experiences um, in community food growing, as a lot of people have um, through, through community gardens. One of the things that cracks me up the most is that like literally, I don't think I've ever been to one community garden where the community hasn't started to argue within itself, you know? It's quite a really strange thing, but um, I've, I look at that quite a lot. And I think that maybe somewhere within that, maybe we can all start to find ways about how we can make our spaces safer for everybody, do you know what I'm saying? And really address that with the fact that, that things do go wrong, you know? There are um, unconscious biases and stereotypes and things that come into play when it comes to different races, but then there's also different things that come into play when it comes to people just being territorial and fighting over power and, you know, all sorts of different things that I think with all of those areas, I think as communities, we need to have those types of conversations and go into a direction which is right. So it leads to the point that was ringing around into my head with what would you do is my answer to everybody about how to make a community better. The first thing to do is to just be a good person. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> I hope that answers that. I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you how the answer to that question, but genuinely I would say be a good person, man. Do you know what I'm saying? And when there's things that are going on around you that aren't right, yeah. try to make a stand and, and, and support that. Do you know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of people that are affected largely by people not speaking up when things aren't right. Do you know what I'm saying? And collectively, spaces are affected when people don't speak up about what's right. And you know, different issues can come into play. So keeping that communication open, keeping yeah. aware that there are issues and, and situations that will come out, and trying to keep that positive, that dialogue positive and directional into creating better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers that. Yeah, I mean that is that is a big question, but um, I think you. It's yeah. a good question. It's a really, really, yeah, really good question. Yeah, it's it's a good question, but yeah, it's a bit difficult. But I mean, just going back to like you know, growing culturally appropriate food, that's also one of you know a really important 
thing that you can adopt in and in within your spaces to create more welcoming environments for people. Um, and let's see. And sorry, I would say this as well. Um, sorry, Edmund. That, um, I think one of the things that as you come to, um, to visit Walls Lane, something I didn't touch on is Walls Lane is actually run by a consortium of three different groups. So there's Organic Lee, which a lot of you guys might know already. Um, Ubele, who's the organization that I work, which is the black led organization and also Crop Drop, um, an amazing organization. So they do amazing voluntary projects and provide um, food bags. Um, so food, veg box schemes. So it's commercial, but also really social with the, with the volunteering and things that they do. So these three organizations have come together to form the consortium at Rules Lane, and they're very, very, very much invested in that question. So as I said, it's really interesting because the answers aren't there, but that's one of the models where we're really trying to work out how we can create like that real safe and open space for everybody, do you know what I mean? So hopefully there's something in that Rules Lane um, consortium format that, that the answer to the question that you're, that you're, that you're asking there would be found. Yes, um, and we'll put the um, put the links for those three organizations that you mentioned as well um, that in the group chat. Let's see, oh, do we have anything else? Someone said it would be good to have um, a guide um, to kind of know what to plant, the different plants, which um, kind of which non-native plants you can grow in the UK. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know if any good um, any good guide for that? I think that question was kind of half asked before. Was it David? I'm not sure. Um, but that is something, as I said, that um, William yeah, and Arlena. Mm -hmm. Sorry? That's why Claudia, Claudia French asked that yeah. question. Um, oh, well, sorry, what I meant was um, to know when to plant each yeah. plant, not yeah. just which plants. Yeah. And as I said, because my knowledge isn't there, it's like they, these, the, the, the plans that the guys are creating now, also a lot of the stuff that they're doing is experimental because some of the plants haven't been grown here effectively before. And also they're acquiring um, a database of different types of successfully grown plants. So one, once that's collected and put together through um, the work being done at Black Roots, that will be put out in, in some kind of publicated format, which I can't necessarily speak on, but I think it's a great thought because that would be a really good um, resource to have. So that's something that we are definitely working on. Um, hello. Hi, hello. Carol. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, brother. Yes, brother. Yeah, we love we love information and Thank you. bringing the, the the younger generation, so to speak, with the elders, will sort of generate a lot of good, positive vibes and a lot of knowledge that can pass down, can benefit younger youths. And when I said youths, I mean both genders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and in regard to the sister who just asked, what sort of um, vegetable, what sort of um, um, food we can plant now is the right time to start putting like brassaticas, such like cabbage, kale, you know, spring onion, leeks, garlics, you know, and if, you, if, if you're working into a greenhouse environment like a polytunnel, then you can start putting even your cucumber, your tomatoes now, but you have to sort of create that subtropical environment, so to speak, then. You know, and like sweet potatoes, yam, the long, deep-rooted um, crops. So, you know, yam probably take eight to nine months, sweet potato and dashing, which is, we're talking about cultural appropriate food, a much long-term crop and even how to sort of nurture the soil to sort of get the best out of the soil, what you're growing with, because, you know, I look at growing food, not only to grow food, because whatever you feed your food with, that's what your food comes. So I'm looking at even the fertilizer, even the soil, the condition, all of those that you're feeding food with, then all of that have to take in consideration, really, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, and Amaran San Kalalo, a good time now to start set out that now. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. your, your name says Carol, but I'm not sure if that's actually your name. <laughs> Asha. Asha. Well, yeah. Kara, the Empress. <laughs> and this, is the, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what happens. And this is why like for me is it's like, like when you want to get knowledge, it's get to your community, get to the people that are actually there doing it. Do you know what I'm saying? And um and listen and learn and well, share, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm a grower, I'm, I, I own an allotment and yeah, 
you know, chocho and them something they can plant at the moment because you get chocho run up about till November. Mm. And and just while we're on Asha, just while we're speaking now, are you connected to any organizations yourself? Yes, we start up yeah with um, Rastafari UK, which is RM UK. We did, we did plant some vegetable in the early summer of last year, which we share a lot of that with our community by volunteer to go and deliver it and you know, a lot of amaranths, amaranths, literally, you know, I don't have to plant amaranths, just dig the soil and come back up again because the seed is in the earth, in, in, in the soil and it's stay for as long as it can possibly be. And whereabouts, whereabouts are you based, Asha? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm around Croydon. Right. Yeah, we have an allotment with more, you know, majority of the plot holders are, you know, Jamaican community elders and, you know, young people. And, and, and just that, just on that note, I mean, I don't know if there's any other specific questions, but when you just mentioned Croydon, I know there's a very interesting story that came out of Croydon about a young man um, who was actually going to speak about today called um, Isaiah Levi. Do you yeah. know about this guy? Uh, no, no, no. I say that to say this is that um, Isaiah was a young man that actually inspired a hell of a lot of people, a hell of a lot of young people that, um, that I've spoken to, particularly in South London, to actually grow culturally appropriate foods. If anybody can catch up on this guy's story, it's actually amazing. He passed away a couple of years ago, not that long ago. Um, young man, and he, he developed this passion to grow all these different varieties of food. He developed an organization called Isaiah, Isaiah Seeds. And yeah. he distributed these seeds anywhere that anybody requested them, any, anywhere in the world. Absolutely amazing, absolutely inspirational. And it's one of the stories that we speak about a lot when we go down to South London and Credit. And I'll definitely like to um, connect with you and your organization, Asha, if possible. Yes, if, 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 if you speak to Sister Stella. Yeah. Yeah, is Sister Stella on the line? Yeah. I mean, we can take the conversation offline because I'm very conscious of the time. It's coming up to seven o'clock now. Um, Edmund, if there's any other questions or anything, or do you want to? What I do, I, 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 give, I give him my contacts then. Yeah. And then we can link from there. Ah, what you right. can do is you can put that, if you can put that onto the, the chat, if you could send it on the, on the chat and type that in, then I'll be able to receive that there. And then, and again, I'm really conscious of the time, Edmund. Yeah, um, we're just coming, but there's two minutes left. Um, I think there was another question from Claudia, but I'm not sure if you'll, um, Claudia French. Do you have a question? Yeah, can I open my mic and say the question? Is that quicker? Yeah. Yes, quickly, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a very short time. Um, I'm, just one thing that hasn't really been touched on that I'm just wondering about, and it's something that I've thought many years about, and I've never really got an answer, and I'm just wondering um, if you, Junior, or perhaps anyone else knows. Um, when, when, when we plant stuff that's not autochthonous to this, to, to, to this country, to the UK, and we're planting stuff that's from other countries. In the past, sometimes seeds and weeds have gone, kind of run amok and gone out of the area where they were supposed to be grown or blown on the wind or whatever, and mm. have caused problems with native species. For example, the rhododendron, which was brought in from India 150 mm. years ago, yeah. which has kind of colonized uh, areas and taken out lots of native species. And I'm just wondering whether that's an issue that, that people need to think about when growing food uh, plants which are autochthonous of other other countries and whether we need to grow them like in an enclosed space or anything like that do you do you know anything about that because i've wondered about that for a long time i think it's a good question but um i wouldn't have the technical knowledge on that and again just based on time um it's a good question and i think that there, there may be I, I wouldn't have the answer for that, I'm sorry. And I'm just so aware that based on time, it might not be worth asking anybody else in a group unless somebody can throw it into the chat now. But well, I, I, would, well, I can I say something. Sorry, can go say on. A Jay, Jay, yeah. Jay, I know you are. Oh, is that Glenda? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even recognize you. <laughs> just to, just to even um, touch upon what the, the sister has asked, it's that yeah. the case of um, cross-fertilization of any of our foods, we would have seen that in other foods as of from now. Um, I don't know whether a chocho has cross, cross bred with anything else, we would see the outcome of that. Or if anything's some tampered, cross fertilized and tampered with our food, we would recognize that. But up until this day, I've not heard or seen any plants which are growing any different to what we know from back home. It's the purity of the seeds and how they've come, I suppose. Yeah. 
that's all I could say. I think the issue is more like rather than like contaminating other plants, it's that what I think what's happened in the past sometimes, you know, like in colonial times when people brought loads of plants from other countries and just put them into the earth in Britain without thinking about it. And then those plants sort of took over and actually killed off uh, native plants. And that's and I'm just wondering, perhaps there's like researchers have done research on this somewhere. I don't know. But if there's a publication coming out about, uh, um, you know, this kind of um, growing food that's come from other countries, it might be really useful to kind of, I don't know, if, if, if anyone knows anything about that or if any research has been done about it, because I think I'm it's, just, it's I'm an just issue gonna, which is quite interesting. Sorry, sorry. I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut in. So sorry. Um, I am aware of the time. Thank you, Junior, for being such a good timekeeper. <laughs> I think um, Idman and I are grateful to have you looking at the clock. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and, um, and a big thanks again to Idman for, um, for putting this session tonight and, and making contact with Junior and, um, and having you come along and share your experiences, Junior. It was really great to hear about your journey and your experiences, but also the kind of wider context of what you're doing at Black Roots. Um, and we're all really excited um, to see what comes of the new uh, project, Roots into Food Growing as well. So we're all keeping an eye on that and we want to support in any way. Um, I was really interested in what you said about bringing together the knowledge in the community and and, and learning from our elders and, and the kind of cultural knowledge. Um, and I'm aware that this was less of a technical session about growing culturally appropriate food growing, um, but more um, about why it's so important to adopt practices of growing different types of fruit and veg, um, because that's so vital to creating growing spaces that are more welcoming and appropriate for everyone in our community. So yeah, just really grateful to you for kind of, um, for, um, setting that kind of scene and, and inspiring um, inspiring others. Thank you everyone for joining us. As Idman mentioned earlier, we have another session in this series taking place tomorrow evening and that's focused on um, uh, welcoming young people and encouraging young people to um, get more involved in food growing. Um, we're gonna be joined by Mona um, from May Project. Um, so really excited about that. And another panel discussion next week on Wednesday um, about more connections with the local community to really create um, more welcoming and more resilient community gardens and growing spaces. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight and you hope you'll right. tune in soon. Thanks again, Edman and Junior. Thank you, thank you, thank you, so much, Junior. Thank you everybody. Thank you. And please make sure to um, save the chat. Lots of beautiful stuff. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. God bless. Bless. Really good to see you, Glenda. I'm going to be on the phone to you soon. Thank yeah. you. Wait long time. Long time. Thank you. Long time. Bless it. Bless and, it. And honestly, thank you, everybody, as well. And as many of you like that, could we see you at Wolves Lane? That would be amazing. Anyone that could get down to Tottenham and visit, it's an awesome site, awesome project. Love to see as many of you there as possible. Bless. See you later, guys. Bye. Thank you.